Hi folks, my name is Franco Tenelli and today I'm going to show you 14 steps to a good routine for a pot job development. Let me first read it for you and then give you a little more detailed explanation of what you're supposed to do. Number one, correct standings, comfortable standings. Number two, Diaphragmical breathing with lips closed. Number three, short resonant sounds produced with push down technique. Number four, pre warm ups. Number five, declamation of the known aria passages. Number six, singing short passages with appoggio application. Number seven, understanding and feeling appoggio articulation. Number eight, Routine warm ups. Number nine, singing aria or song, letting go through without stoppage for the first time. Emphasis on difficult moments and technical solutions is number ten. Eleven, emphasis on artistic value. Number twelve, trying to combine number ten and eleven. Number D, at the end of the lesson, explaining priorities in learning new material. And number fourteen, Remind you to fix what was done in the lesson and learning new habits. Okay. There is one number 15 which is very important that I'm going to explain. How to practice separation of tensions. This is going to be number 15. And I explain what separation of tensions is, why do we need separation of tensions. So let's start with correct and comfortable standing. How do we stand when we sing? It's very important because that provides us with correct breathing also. We will feel less fatigued if we do it right. You know perfectly that sometimes standing is more tiring than walking. Why is that? Because while walking we kind of put different accents and different tensions on different parts of the body. If you stand rigidly then the tension goes through body and the body does not rest. And for in our case, singing is more like standing in uh, oriental martial arts, except, of course, not that exaggerated. I'm going to show you how approximately a singer should stand when he is uh, singing. So you see, you should never stand like this, because that limits your flexibility. Even if you stand in a correct position, which is more like this, two legs apart, one is a little bit more forward and one in the back. It's kind of a martial arts position, except that martial arts is more wide and needs a, a more kind of a swing. That's not all, because if you stand like this, but you stand rigid, it's not also good. So what you have to do during the singing, you have to get used to are putting very gently and gradually the emphasis from one leg to another, so it's kind of swinging move. So when you sing, you can, you can as I do this, you know, on stage. If you're singing on stage, nobody will notice you in your movements because they're far away. They're small, very subtle movements, but that makes your body. So when you sing an aria, you can. It's also expressive, you know. That is a correct standing. So it has to be comfortable and this is one of those comfortable and stage-like standings for you. Now, imitating a poggio movement, actually doing a poggio movement in your diaphragm, low abdominals, and instead of singing, using your lips as a virtual vocal cords. So let's say if you do something like this, you can check out if your muscles work appoggio or they work different way. What is the sign of appoggio? When you do some kind of lip appoggio, you should have a sandwich effect in your stomach. What it means, if your stomach goes in, it means that your diaphragm is very passive. It's not opposing the abdominal muscles. Therefore, it's not balancing them. Though, if you notice, so you should put your hand and check it out when you do your lip apogee. 
what is the real action. So it has to be a sandwich effect. Again, the stomach should go like. Let me show you closer that, okay? Now, an experienced with appoggio singer might think that when I do this, I'm breathing in. So, it's a controversial for them to understand how the stomach goes like this, why the air goes actually upwards. It's controversial. But there's nothing controversial if you look deeper. Because, again, what I'm saying is low abdominal muscles pushing up. The diaphragm is trying to balance them. And in between, there's a stomach. So, it gets caught between diaphragmical push and low abdominal push, and therefore, it gets like a sandwich effect. So, you see, I'm a little exaggerating with the movement, but, so, lip appoggio. So, how do you check? Again, I repeat, you have to do what I showed you, and you have to actually put your hand on your stomach and look if your stomach is getting inside. That's not a poggio. And if it gets, like, I controversially, seemingly controversially out, then it's a good appoggio, at least lip appoggio. You have to practice that for a while. Now, when you understand the lip appoggio and you're done with this, exercise, then you can move to sounds more close to what you're going to do in the future. Produce with the same technique something like we call Caruso like to do. It's called, um, I've never read it from Caruso himself, but Benjamino Gili used to talk about Enrico Caruso liked to use so-called barking exercise. Barking exercise. So it's like you can use it in your own way. We don't know how Caruso did it, it really was barking or not. But it's something like this. Boom, boom. Like you did this with the lips without really any resonance. You just were doing. Now you're trying to produce a resonant sound with the same apogeal movement. So please hold your hand because otherwise nobody will control it. So you have to do something like. Boom, boom, mwah, mwah. M, mm, mm, B. B and M are very useful. You can use other consonants. They are very resonant. Mm. They can sound even with your closed mouth. Mm. B, 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 B. Mm. Mom. B, B. Something like this. Something that will connect you further to a poetry. Because before you kind of learn the movement and then the second, you're learning the movement with the sound. It's not yet a vocal sound, but we're going there step by step. Now, number four is pre-warm ups. I talked about this, I have a program about pre-warm ups. Important idea about pre-warm ups that you eventually create your own routine, your own individual warm ups. It's very important because that's the philosophy of pre-warm ups. Of course, you can get idea from other singers, but don't just be naive taking idea of the great singers, either Caruso or anybody else, or the living singer who suggests, well, this is my whatever, and I'll do the same thing. You have to, through pre-warm ups, it's your individual time to understand your own nature, your own system, without anybody telling you, because you are the person who's singing, and you're the person who's feeling your voice. Your teacher cannot sense and feel the way you do, no matter how good it is. So you have to kind of, uh, this is your very private time. If you're not shy, you can use it in, uh, among, uh, you know, I've seen the great singers doing their own routine and pre-warm up sometimes make me laugh because they were sometimes funny. But they have confidence to do it in opera house and in the dressing up rooms. If you have a problem with doing this, you're kind of shy. So I first recommend to do it privately. Just have fun with the resonance. That's the main thing. Have fun with the resonance. Find out. Of course, this is not total freedom because we're talking about the sound that we're going to use eventually in classical music. 
So this pre-war map is tend to develop a good apoggio chiaroscuro sum. So the main, uh, maybe the only condition in that is that you do it with chiaroscuro sum. The rest is up to you. So you have to develop this. Now, in, uh, let just show you some of the pre-war maps that I do. I just, uh, honestly, I don't use the same thing all the time. I kind of try to find out where my voice is, and sometimes it lies in the low, sometimes in the middle, sometimes it's high. So I do not struggle with the nature of my voice today. I let it go. Very few singers know. Some singers like routine, almost a routine, routine exercises. They will always do the same thing all the time. I think it's a mistake because you have to respect the voice and the resonance of your voice. That's the main routine for, say, pre-war maps. There's nothing routine about pre-war maps, if you like. But for I, what I do, I do many, many things. I cannot show everything. And it's not really important for you to know my routine. It's to get the idea when you sound resonant, free and joyful. Now, pre-war maps may be weird because it's like animalistic sounds, kind of. It's not uh, refined uh, appoggio operatic sound, but they already very close to it. So my pre-war maps will be like yeah, scanning the whole voice oh, and doing it without any formal tension or anything, just, you know, having fun, you know? It's very important because you, in pre-war maps, you're not only warming up your physical nature of your voice, you're warming up the whole thing. And so your voice, if you warm up like formally, mm -hmm, you'll be formally singing. If you will warm up with joy, there is a hope that when you sing, there will be true expression and not expression of tensions. So number five is a declamation of the known arias that you learn, either 24 arias or something more challenging, it doesn't matter. Declamation, not singing, but declamation like a studio actor, like something on a stage, a drama stage, not Hollywood, where you still need projection. Like, you know, very, sorry for being corny about <laughs> this phrase, it's like, to be or not to be, that is the question. I'm sorry, I'm not a drama actor. I have some drama actors who attend my lessons because they learn how to do these things on resonance. I had one actor coming to me because he said, uh, Franco, I don't know what to do. I have to scream in a play and I get emotional and so after two plays I lost my voice. <laughs> I cannot do it anymore. How to do? Of course, in, uh, the drama actors, they face the same problems as singers sometimes. So when they want to produce a resonant sound, if they don't know, especially when it's a very emotional sound, like crying, OH MY GOD! I know the theatre sounds a little bit pretentious. It's like the movie is more realistic in the sense that people don't talk like this in real life. But in the theatre, if you don't talk like this uh, in a drama theater, you won't be heard. It's like projection. Projection is involved here. So it's easy, a lot easier, of course, to do that than to sing that canto. But that is another step towards understanding the resonance and especially developing your declamation appoggio. That would be very grateful for actors, of course, and it's not less grateful, useful for us as singers. Now, when you've done this uh, dramatic declamation, you can go now to singing. Not singing the aria or even the whole piece of the vocalises, but just phrase from very well-known pieces that you know, just a phrase. And try to apply those things that you learned just before. It's the, the apoggio application. For example, you can use, for tenors especially, they know it, that other singers can use that too. Is the tongue twister from Rigoletto when the Duke comes into uh, his palace and he says, It's a tongue twister, and you can do it slower, and you can do it the emphasis on Della mia bella. You see, Della mia bella. All this is a poncho. This is not Della mia bella, in Golida Borghese. This Della mia bella, in Golida Borghese. Some people say, wow, well, I'm supporting. No, you're not supporting a here if you're doing this way. Because 
yes, of course, the air has to come through, and there's a certain uh, support involved, but it's not a poggio articulation here. If you do the sound becomes a lot bigger and a lot easier to produce and a lot easier to articulate, but you need to get used to it. So, so any push that boom, boom, happens here, not here. This is how you do it. You can use easier things like Don't go any further. Just examine the phrase, observe it, and sing it to different keys. And make sure that your articulation is a poggio articulation. So you learn it along with uh, producing the sound. This is one important thing I want you to know. There is a phenomenon, and you are very familiar with that phenomenon, of the parallel tensions in human body. What is the parallel tension? So we know, for some reasons, uh, biologists or anthropologists, scientists, they know the reason probably, but we as a layman, we don't know the reason, but it's, it's a fact. When we use one tension, it's intensive tension in in one part of the body, let's say you do something like you, you do your homework, you're screwing up something like, and your teeth getting tight also, or you're doing something else, and some other parts of the body gets tense. I mean, if you look at this, there is no reason for them to get tense. I mean, they don't help you. They actually exhaust you much more. But that's the human being. When, for example, I told you that a poetry is very physical, so you need certain time to develop your muscles correctly and when they become stronger and stronger then you will really enjoy the full advantage of a poncho. But while developing this tension and you know this is, can, can be very tiring here but the good news you don't get tired in your vocal cords and here there's a little trap. When I say if you use a poncho, you, know, you don't need to get tired here. Remember I say you don't need, but it doesn't mean you want. Because again, as I told you about parallel tensions in our body, most of us, I'm not saying all, but most of us, like try to make an apoggio tension, okay, and then look into the mirror at the same time, and you see, in most of the cases, maybe not so obviously, but your jaw, your tongue gets tense. So if you move like this, this gets tense. So that, it's almost like um, intuitive movement, incorrect, but intuitive movement of the body. You cannot do it unless you kind of look upon it and you try to do an exercise. This exercise is on 15, but I mentioned it because we just mentioned apoggio articulation and other stuff. So the best way to practice a separation of this tension of the stomach and diaphragm from the tension here is to play a complete idiot in your face. Benjamino Gili, it's not me. Benjamino Gili told that, you know, he just specifically told about high notes because high notes create more tension. So he said when you sing the high note, pretend you're like, like a total uh, countryman simpleton. You know, what he meant is basically an idiot. So exaggerate an idiot. So you have to have your face like uh, really, really exaggerated. The best thing, of course, it will be if you be watching yourself in a mirror because sometimes it doesn't. You think you're 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 an idiot, but you're not yet an idiot, total idiot. You need to be a total idiot in here, total separation. And what you do here, it, it's easier to kind of practice that without singing because singing involves another realm in your memory. You just do this. You do tension here. And here you make sure that this, when you do this tension, this is absolutely separated. And this is absolutely separated from the tension. And it's like uh, total, total, exaggerated uh, relaxation. At the same time, you push it hard here and you relax here. So if you practice that at least five minutes per day, I guarantee you that in a month you will be understanding the separation of these movements and your jaw slowly in singing will become more and more independent of the tensions and eventually that's, that's where we are going to. Basically number seven is understanding the apoggio articulation. It's that's, I already talked about this. That apoggio articulation is very different from normal articulation. It's like an actor in a theater. 
To be or not to be. If you say it without resonance, to be or not to be, like in the regular time, that's not a pojo. Because that's all the energy is, is rooted here. And you don't need more energy because you need a bigger sound. So you can get away with that. And even in the movies, you can be more natural. You say, to be or not to be. That is the question. But in the theater, you won't be heard unless you like to get it. This is what the understanding the routine and articulation. The apoggio articulation is quite somewhat different. It doesn't mean that this moves differently, but it's a relaxed way and you use explosive consonants. Della mia bella. And at the same time, this is absolutely free. As I showed in my articulation lessons, you can uh, go and watch those apoggio articulation lessons. Now, when you're done with the 7, then you go to the 8. This is more routine. When you're confident with your voice, you know it, it's resonant, it's there. Now we can go to routine. And again, I would advise you to have the same attitude, not to be that formal. Uh, some of the students, they take it like this. No, have joy, have fun when you do this, okay? So you do... Oh, or whatever routine is it, it is you're using. You can use scales, you can use, sometimes you start with vakai, it's very good, vocalist is with words, and then it explains how to use a correct articulation. It doesn't explain how to use a podio articulation, but that the sounds, the consonants should be short, and the vowels should be resonant. That's the, that's the main and more general explanation of how you should articulate. But without understanding specifically what should I do to develop this. So uh, it's very important for number seven, Okay, if you're with the teacher, and of course it's the teacher's job to, to let you do certain things, but I would recommend, in this case for the teacher, if he, is, he isn't present, to let his student or her student to just sing it without any interruption. Let them sing and let them first express it absolutely free. Let them free freedom, even then make mistakes, it doesn't matter. But let them feel, oh, the joy of it, you know? Oh my goodness, it's so joyful to sing this, okay? And then, the second part, when you go into the analysis, then let's do it again, and then you analyze, you stop your students, you warn him up, you, you tell him that now I'm going to stop you, and I'm going to look at you. Now, if you're with the teacher, it's up to the teacher. If you're working alone and you're recording yourself, you do the same thing. You let yourself be free. Just, you know, just have fun. Okay? This is the idea. Even the resonance should be on the second uh, priority. Have fun. And the second time, try to be more specific. Sing phrase by phrase. Try to analyze and try to perfect them. But when you're singing in an aria, you have to put a certain passages which are difficult to make notes that these passages are difficult and to understand how to resolve these challenges. It's very important. So, number 10 is emphasis on difficult moments and technical solutions. What is technical solutions? Sometimes uh, the phrase that you're singing is very challenging. It has so many challenging points that no matter how long you sing this phrase, how many times you sing the phrase, it sometimes does not even improve, it's, it deteriorates. So, what's the, how can we make it better instead of make it worse? Uh, the best solutions, one of the solutions, I'm not giving you all of them, is to make this phrase lower in pitch, up to three points. There's no, it doesn't make any sense if you do it lower, then you change your voice category. But up to three points, you can lower this phrase, you try to half a tone lower, or the whole tone, or you know, the, the third, minor third lower, and you see, if it sits comfortably, you find a more comfortable tonality for this. Remember that this is very important for you to fix other problems with not just the tessitura problems. So when you're taking the tessitural problems away from you, you still have some problems in this particular phrase. So you can fix it up without thinking about tessitura. So just articulation, maybe good resonance and everything. And when you're done with this and you think you're satisfied, oh, now I'm very good, then you can go up to the higher and eventually up to the correct key even challenging yourself to sing the same phrase in a higher key. And then you'll understand that this can be fixed by difficult problems on three or more, 
easy solution. So that's kind of a Descartes type of uh, attitude here. Number 11, I already mentioned, is the emphasis on joy when you say it. It's very important. And people think sometimes that, you know, yes, I understand, uh, you know, we have to sing with joy, but I have still so many technical problems that, you know, when I'm done with my technical problems, when I'm done with them, then I will definitely fix that. Uh, maybe, maybe, but maybe not, because remember, if you're perfectionist by nature, you will never be satisfied with your technical abilities. Never. Even if you're leading, uh, like uh, Franco Corelli was, uh, never satisfied with his technical abilities, though many consider him one of the best technicians among uh, dramatic tenors, there could be an objective reason, of course. If, let's say, if, if you or your teacher gives you a very challenging aria, that is really not, you should be singing this aria probably two or three years from now, but he gave it right now to you, so kind of you, you become frustrated and fearful of this. Of course, you cannot be confident with that. This is simply wrong. But if you take a challenging, but up to your level challenging audience, then you definitely can and should develop the attitude of the joy when you're singing. Because uh, anything in our life is like a habit, you know? If you develop this uh, approach to sing like like a soldier and like a soldier of a classical music following the score and there's nothing, joy should not be there, you will get used to it. When you become a performing artist and uh, the guy with the career, you suddenly won't change. Because that will be your habit. So as soon as you can, you should practice the joy and... Now, when you separate these two, like singing artistically and expressively, trying to put your perfectionist nature behind you just to enjoy it, okay? And then try to do it technically. And then you try to combine those things. And if it doesn't work for the first time, you do it again and again. And eventually you will unite this to perfection and joy at the same time and that will be a great thing for you. Well, number 13, I already mentioned that, is explaining priorities in learning new material. Lowering the key of the difficult phrase up to three steps down and raising it slowly and even higher than original. I mentioned that. And then, of course, when you go to homework, you of course reminding to fix that what was done in the lesson and learning, of course, new audios and stuff. So, basically, we have 14 kind of routine exercise plus one, which is a separation of the tension. I do not put it in a routine because it doesn't involve any sound anyways. So kind of getting a separation from the lower abdominal stomachs, I get really tight, and here kind of, you know, easy. Or you can also try to do these movements and speak at the same time, and you see how you may get tails, you know. So that is um, very important. I would say this is a routine, but there's nothing routinish about this routine. because. In a way, you have to keep your eyes open, you have to keep your ear open when you do it. And not routine in the world can help you if you just follow that mechanically without being creative. So I wish you the best and I hope this lesson will help you to understand how to develop and how to learn yourself. Thank you very much. That was Franco Tanelli, Science of Singing.